I have just done something that Franklin Delano Roosevelt could never do on any day of his 12-year presidency. Nineteen forty five. As the global war reached its devastating climax, Franklin Roosevelt was the supreme figure of the wartime alliance, but also a man living on borrowed time. Roosevelt's health was collapsing. Sapped by chronic heart disease and by two decades as a secret paraplegic. One wartime American general nicknamed him Rubber Legs. But few Americans were aware that their president could not walk unaided or that he'd been diagnosed as being on the brink of cardiac failure. Despite these secrets, however, the public Roosevelt stands as one of America's most remarkable presidents. He crafted a new deal to drag America out of the depression of the 1930s. And amid the catastrophe of World War II, he envisioned a new deal to redeem the whole world. We are going to win the war and we are going to win the peace that follows. Roosevelt would not survive the war, yet his desperate bid to create a lasting peace and his tangled legacy in the post-war world is one of the great stories of the 20th century. By 1945, Franklin Roosevelt was a man inspired by visions of a better world, yet also gripped by deep personal anxieties. America's wheelchair president, racing to shape the future before his past caught up with him. At the beginning of November 1944, American forces were delivering killer blows to the enemy. The American army dominated the war in Western Europe. In the Pacific, the American Navy had penetrated deep into Japanese coastal waters to hunt down enemy shipping. At home, the arsenal of democracy was producing more combat aircraft than Britain and Russia combined. Pundits were already talking of the superpowers, with America in a league of its own. Franklin Roosevelt had been elected president for an unprecedented fourth term. He was the most powerful man in the world, yet ironically, one powerless over much of his own body. On election night, 7th of November 1944, Roosevelt sat here on the front porch of Springwood, the family mansion in Hyde Park, some 75 miles north of New York, savouring the taste of victory. From the porch, FDR could look along the avenue to the Albany Post Road. It was a view he knew so well. In the early 1920s, he'd stared at it day by day in a mixture of hope and despair. A mere quarter mile, this was a journey he longed to make, but for years his legs couldn't manage it and now his heart was too weak as well. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's character was forged in a unique crucible of privilege and then adversity. He was the only son of wealthy New York gentry, one of the river families whose grand estates spread out expansively along the banks of the Hudson. 
After a pampered childhood, dominated by his widowed mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, he went to Groton, modeled on the English Victorian public schools, on to Harvard, and then into a Manhattan law firm, a good springboard for politics. Roosevelt also married well. Eleanor was his fifth cousin once removed and a niece of President Theodore Roosevelt. She brought a wealth of useful connections for a young man with political ambitions. Over the next 11 years, she gave birth to a girl, Anna, and five boys, one of whom died before his first birthday. Eleanor was an intelligent, intense, but shy young woman. Marriage gave her new confidence and poise, but she was still prone to crippling nerves and to what she called Griselda moments when she went into a deep sulk. <laughs> The young FDR, by contrast, modelled himself on Uncle Ted with his brash, whirlwind style, even though his own branch of the family were Democrats, not Republicans. His early political career was dazzling. FDR rose through New York State politics to become Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I, while still in his 30s. The Navy became a lifelong passion. But even more enduring was the influence of his wartime boss, President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson tried to sell Americans on his vision for a lasting peace, built around the League of Nations. But the Senate rejected his plans, America slipped back into isolationism, and Wilson himself was laid low by a massive stroke, which paralyzed him and the remainder of his presidency. For the rest of his life, FDR would be inspired by Wilson's political ideals and also haunted by Wilson's personal tragedy. In 1920, aged 38, FDR ran as the Democratic Party's vice presidential candidate. Although the Democrats lost, he was clearly a rising star, yet one already with secrets. This was a man who flew high but lived dangerously. FDR reveled in the attention that came with politics. In 1918, one journalist penned this almost sensuous portrait. His face is long, firmly shaped and set with marks of confidence. Intensely blue eyes rest in light shadow. A firm, thin mouth breaks quickly to laugh, openly and freely. Roosevelt knew he was attractive to women, and he enjoyed it. Although married with a family, he was an incorrigible flirt. But his affection for Lucy Mercer, Eleanor's secretary, was no mere flirtation. We're all alone, no chaperone can get our number. The world's in slumber, let's misbehave. Lucy was tall and elegant, with a rich voice, deep eyes, and a dazzling smile. Just how far things went between them during World War I is not clear, but FDR seems to have talked for a time about marriage. Their letters were certainly passionate, as Eleanor discovered when she found them by chance in 1918. Shocked, in panic for a while, she felt utterly betrayed. There was talk of divorce. But Franklin's mother, Sarah, weighed in hard, warning her son that if he renounced his wife, shaming the family name, she would disinherit him and he would not get another cent. FDR had to listen. But the prize extracted by Eleanor for staying together was Franklin's promise that he would never see Lucy again. The affair would have ended many marriages. But Franklin still admired and respected Eleanor, her fierce intelligence, her passionate sense of right and wrong. For her part, Eleanor still believed in Franklin, maybe even loved him, though theirs was almost certainly no longer a sexual relationship. And the tension eased in 1920 
when she learned that Lucy had married a wealthy New York businessman. But then in August 1921 came a different and even more devastating setback for the Roosevelts. FDR was struck down by poliomyelitis. The disease was generally known as infantile paralysis because it particularly afflicted children, causing them to scream in agony and lose control of their bodily functions. Gradually, painfully, Roosevelt began to recover. But his thighs and legs remained unusable and he was confined to a wheelchair. Hating the hospital variety, FDR had wheels put on ordinary wooden chairs, which were less obtrusive. He had a special car made, which he could drive without using any foot pedals. At Springwood, ramps were installed, and he was moved from floor to floor via a pulley lift in the servants' quarters, originally used for cases and trunks. Let me be blunt about what polio had done to this handsome, ambitious, virile politician. He was now a man who could not dress or undress himself, who had to be heaved into bed or placed on a toilet. In the language of the time, he was now a cripple at the age of 39. How would he face such a life? Franklin's mother was once again quite sure what the future must be. Her beloved son should retreat to the Hudson and retire from public view. But FDR refused to heed his mother's wishes, intent on making a political comeback. He called his polio a childish disease, something that a strong adult should simply outgrow. Against all the odds, this mama's boy, whom she dressed for much of his childhood in girls' clothes and little Lord Fauntleroy outfits, dug deep, finding an iron determination and radiating hope. FDR had a simple, straightforward faith in God. Like his father, he was a vestryman at the local Episcopal church and was sustained by an underlying belief that Providence was watching over him. In the worst sleepless nights of his illness, he would tell himself that this was trial by fire, testing his moral fibre for challenges to come. That faith and resilience would become an essential part of his charisma as a political leader. As he would say in later life, once you have spent two years trying to wiggle one toe, everything is in proportion. Roosevelt's battle with himself accentuated the secretiveness ingrained in him as an only child. Being mysterious, Holding his cards close to his chest would become central to FDR's political identity, allowing him to be all things to all men. In 1939, the Washington Press Corps caricatured him as the Sphinx. Even those closest to Roosevelt only understood a fraction of his mind and very little of his heart. He often said that he never let his left hand know what his right was doing. Which hand am I, Mr. President? asked Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau anxiously on one occasion. Morgenthau was an old friend and Hudson Valley neighbor. Roosevelt smiled sweetly. You are my right hand, then he added, but I keep my left under the table. Divide and rule, that would be Roosevelt's motto in politics as in private life.
No one stereotyped as a man in a wheelchair could hope to succeed politically in that day and age. Somehow Roosevelt had to walk again, or at least appear to. He was fitted with a heavy steel corset and braces, running from hips to heel. The weight was exhausting and the metal cut into his body, but the braces, when locked, enabled him to stand. He then worked to build up his torso so he could maneuver his locked pelvis and legs forward. Finally, he tried to walk. Every morning, imprisoned in what looked like something out of a medieval torture chamber, Roosevelt would stand near the house and vow, I must get down the driveway today. Then he would set out towards the gates using crutches to heave each side of his body forward. After a few steps, he'd pause to rest, covered in sweat. Sometimes he'd crash to the ground and have to be put back, fuming, into his wheelchair. FDR never abandoned hope that he'd make it right down to the Albany Post Road. But after a couple of years of lumbering failure, it became clear that he could not walk freely. He would have to con the public that he could. His chance came in the election campaign of 1924. Roosevelt was booked to give the nominating address at the Democratic Party convention in New York on behalf of the candidate Al Smith. This would be his first appearance in public since polio struck in 1921. He practiced for hours with his teenage son James, so as to be ready to take those few vital steps. Behind the scenes, Roosevelt was helped to his feet and his leg braces locked in place. Then James gave him his crutches. FDR slowly heaved himself across the stage, eyes down, face fixed in concentration. The audience watched in riveted silence. In the gallery, Eleanor knitted like a maniac. When he reached the rostrum, Roosevelt handed back his crutches. He held onto the podium for dear life, grinning broadly as the crowd cheered. Roosevelt spoke for a full half hour with energy and animation, seeming almost to glow in the spotlights. At the end, he praised Al Smith as the happy warrior of the political battlefield, a reference to Wordsworth's poem honoring Admiral Lord Nelson. But it was clear from press reaction that the happy warrior who stood out on that hot June day in New York was not Al Smith, but Franklin Roosevelt. Smith failed to win the presidency in 1924, but tried again in 1928, with Roosevelt once more making the speech of nomination, this time in Houston, Texas. By now, FDR was an accomplished public speaker. More important still, he had become a public walker. Fitted with steel braces and gripping the arm of his son, Elliot, this time, FDR walked to the podium using only a cane. The speech was a complete success. Americans concluded that Roosevelt had clearly recovered. He was no longer crippled, merely a bit lame. In a way, his ordeal now seemed a positive asset. One New York paper lauded him as a figure tall and proud even in suffering, a man softened and cleansed and illumined with pain. Thousands of Americans are here 
to cheer the birth of a new era in national affairs, a New Deal era, which is supposed to pull the country out of its chaos. Four years later, in 1932, with America hit by the worst depression of its history, Roosevelt himself ran for the presidency, gaining a landslide victory and becoming the first Democrat to occupy the White House since his political mentor, Woodrow Wilson. Never was there such a joyful, jubilant, yelling, applauding inauguration crowd. Roosevelt is the nation's idol here today. First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Amazingly, even after he took office, most Americans never discovered Roosevelt's secret. Press and photographers maintained a discreet silence about his disability. The only surviving shots of FDR in a wheelchair come from family photos or home movies. But appearance didn't alter reality. Roosevelt was the wheelchair president and he was trying to lead his country through one of the most testing decades in its history. Yet ironically, I think, Roosevelt's infirmity was his greatest source of power. When he told Americans, traumatized by the depression, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, Roosevelt, more than almost all his countrymen, knew what he was talking about. In his first two terms, Roosevelt was preoccupied with his New Deal for America, to pull the country out of the Depression through massive spending on infrastructure and social programs. But Roosevelt became more and more engaged in foreign policy as Nazism took hold in Europe. Having spent several summers in the Rhineland during his youth, he had long been convinced that the German elite were militaristic expansionists. And he saw through Hitler, describing him as a wild man and a nut. When he read the abridged English edition of Mein Kampf in 1933, FDR wrote caustically in the flyleaf, this translation is so expurgated as to give a wholly false view of what Hitler really is or says. The German original would make a different story. During the 1930s, Roosevelt could do little to shift isolationist attitudes in America. But then came the amazing German conquest of Western Europe in 1940, creating a global crisis. Roosevelt drew America closer to embattled Britain. America was then pitchforked into the global war by the Japanese assault on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Powerful and resourceful gangsters have banded together to make war upon the whole human race. Their challenge has now been flung at the United States of America. We are now in this war. We're all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. In 1942 and 1943, America, allied with Britain, engaged in a brutal struggle against Japan in the Pacific. And also through its troops against the Germans in North Africa. And then Italy, probing what Churchill called the soft underbelly of the Axis, before trying to attack Hitler's hard snout in France. 
the sources of international brutality, wherever they exist, must be absolutely and finally broken. We must begin the great task that is before us by abandoning once and for all the illusion that we can ever again isolate ourselves from the rest of humanity. But the war posed new challenges for an already weary president. Roosevelt didn't simply want victory. He wanted to shape an enduring worldwide peace and avoid a repeat of the tragedy of Woodrow Wilson. For him, I think that meant drawing communist Russia into peacetime cooperation, moving beyond the era of European imperialism, and above all, persuading Americans to take up the burdens of international leadership in an improved version of Wilson's League of Nations. It was in search of those goals that Roosevelt traveled halfway around the world in November 1943 for summit meetings in Tehran and Cairo. Here the man they nicknamed the Sphinx could take the measure of foreign leaders and test his political skills. Would his secretive, enigmatic nature, seeming to be all things to all men, work on the world stage? For Roosevelt, the highlight of the trip was his first meeting with America's other ally, Joseph Stalin. Russia's revolutionary Tsar had now gained the upper hand in his titanic struggle with Hitler. The Red Army was driving the Germans out of the Ukraine. Roosevelt hoped to establish a close, personal relationship with the Soviet leader. Terse, soft-spoken with a dry humor, Stalin seemed like a man with whom he could do business. But Roosevelt had to persuade Winston Churchill the British Prime Minister. Churchill also felt he could work with Stalin personally, but as an inveterate anti-communist, he harbored dark fears about what might happen if Soviet ideology caught fire across Europe. Roosevelt's mind, by contrast, was more open. To him, Stalinism seemed very different from Leninism. The Soviets had dropped the official ideology of world revolution and had allied with the West. Roosevelt genuinely believed, I think, that it was possible to bring the Reds in from the cold into the family of nations and that he was the man to do it. At Tehran, Roosevelt was willing to manipulate his old ally, Winston, to achieve his goal. Keen to show the Soviets that America and Britain weren't operating as a bloc, Roosevelt went out of his way to side with Stalin against Churchill. Together, they baited the British leader about the number of Germans that should be shot after the war. Roosevelt envisaged Russia with Britain as one of the policemen who would ensure peace and order in the post-war world as bulwarks of the new United Nations organization. Roosevelt's other pitch for Stalin's goodwill at Tehran was tied up with his great aim for the post-war world, the end of empire. Imperialism was one of Roosevelt's obsessions but he viewed it as essentially a vice of the Europeans with their far-flung colonial empires. He didn't seem to recognize the expansion of Russia across Asia as imperialist, and certainly not the expansion of the United States from the Atlantic to the Pacific. When meeting on their own at Tehran, Roosevelt treated Stalin almost as a fellow anti-imperialist when discussing how to handle this issue with the reactionary Europeans.
He told Stalin that after a hundred years of French rule in Indochina, the inhabitants were worse off than they'd been before. As for the British Raj in India, Roosevelt advocated what he called reform from the bottom, somewhat on the Soviet line. To which Stalin responded dryly, reform from the bottom would mean a revolution. Roosevelt was delighted by the results of his journey. For him, the meeting with Stalin had been a huge step towards achieving his goal of a new world order no longer centered on the historic great powers of Europe. But the 12,000 mile round trip had taken a massive toll on the president's health. Massive and in fact, fateful. Back in Washington in December 1943, Roosevelt was struck down with flu and seemed unable to regain his strength. At Christmas, he said he felt like a boiled owl. He would nod off in meetings and complained of persistent headaches. Several long breaks in the new year at his beloved Hyde Park did not make a real difference. What's amazing today, I think, is the almost casual amateurishness of the medical care given to the most powerful man in the world. For months, the president's personal physician, Admiral Ross McIntyre, insisted that FDR's problem was simply persistent bronchitis and the after effects of flu. But then McIntyre was a rather strange sort of presidential doctor. McIntyre's day job was Surgeon General of the US Navy, the Navy's top medical post, responsible for 52 hospitals and 175,000 doctors and nurses. Looking after the president was done on the side. He got that job through contacts in the right places and because Roosevelt had a chronic sinus condition and he was an ear, nose and throat specialist. McIntyre did his presidential duties on the run. He'd call in at the White House about 8.30 in the morning and go upstairs to the president's bedroom for what he called a look-see. This consisted of sitting around while Roosevelt, still in bed, ate breakfast and chatted about what was in the morning newspapers. That, said McIntyre, told me all I wanted to know. No thermometer, no stethoscope, no taking the pulse, just listening to his master's voice. This was hardly a model of advanced medical science. It was not until March 1944, when the president was running a temperature of 104 degrees, that McIntyre grudgingly arranged for him to have a checkup at Bethesda Naval Hospital on the outskirts of Washington. In secret, he was put onto the presidential train at Hyde Park and taken for what was probably the first serious medical examination of his whole presidency. Bethesda was the Navy's premier hospital, and the president was being seen by one of its young, up-and-coming cardiologists, Dr. Howard Bruin. FDR was wheeled in, jocular and chatty. He kept that up the whole time, a cover Bruin guessed for inner anxiety. The checkup itself was deeply alarming. These are Dr. Bruin's original examination notes. The president's lungs were congested, his heart enormous, and blood pressure readings dangerously high, 170 over 110, way above the norm. Bruin wrote that he was appalled at what he'd found. 
The diagnosis here is stark. Hypertension, hypertensive heart disease, cardiac failure. FDR's visit to Bethesda could not be kept a secret. But at a press conference, Admiral McIntyre insisted brazenly that the President's health was satisfactory, apart from the lingering effects of flu and bronchitis. What FDR needed, claimed his doctor, was just a bit more exercise and sunshine. Behind the scenes, however, McIntyre fought a desperate rearguard action against Bruin's devastating diagnosis. The young cardiologist was insisting that Roosevelt needed injections of the drug Digitalis to strengthen his heart, a regular daily pattern of rests in bed, and a strict diet to wean him off rich food, his infamous evening cocktails, and 20 or 30 cigarettes a day. McIntyre was absolutely furious. You can't do that! He shouted. This is the President of the United States. But Bruin was sure that is would become was if they didn't act quickly. And he calmly stuck to his guns before three boards of senior Washington medics. Eventually given leave to go ahead, Bruin achieved significant results. After a week of digitalis, the president's lungs were clear and his heart smaller. He was sleeping much better and had cut down his cigarettes to half a dozen a day. But his blood pressure remained very high and with it the risk of a stroke. Yet in those days there were no medications available for high blood pressure and the standard remedies, rest and no stress, were hard to arrange for the most powerful man in the world. But Bruin did what he could. He persuaded FDR to take a break on the estate of an old friend, Bernard Baruch, in South Carolina. Early nights and a lot of fishing were real tonics. Roosevelt liked it so much that he stayed four weeks. But none of this dealt with the basic problem. How could the ailing president survive all the pressures? He had been out of the White House for nine of the first 20 weeks of 1944. He was now back, but was trying to operate on a four-hour day. This was hardly satisfactory for the president of the United States, especially a president who was planning to run for a fourth term. The Washington rumor mill speculated feverishly about how FDR's health would cope with another four years as president. The choice of his new vice presidential running mate would be critical. Roosevelt dithered about the alternatives, only late in the day plumping for the obscure and inexperienced Senator Harry Truman of Missouri and getting very stressed about the whole business. It was another alarming sign of FDR's infirmity. Dr. Howard Brewing was never consulted, but looking back, he had no doubt that a fourth term was a medical impossibility. And deep down, FDR surely knew this too. I think it's telling that at the end of his checkup at Bethesda, the president thanked Dr. Bruin and the staff, but then left without asking a single question. He carried on avoiding any discussion of his real condition with Bruin or any other qualified doctor. I think Roosevelt didn't want to know. Perhaps he couldn't afford to know, for this was a man with a vision who, like most statesmen, had come to see himself as irreplaceable. 
With vision comes hubris, the cardinal sin of all political veterans. In the summer of 1944, as the war boiled up to its climax, the wheelchair president was sure that he had to stay around to shape the political future. But given the desperate state of his health, this was a reckless gamble. The 6th of June, 1944. D-Day, the long-awaited Anglo-American landings in France. News of Operation Overlord was greeted with relief and elation across America. That evening, the president spoke by radio to the American people, not in tones of exultation, but in the form of a simple prayer. Our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee, in this hour of great sacrifice. But for the moment, the GIs didn't get much farther than the hedgerows of Normandy, pinned down by fierce German resistance. Meanwhile, another D-Day dawned on the Eastern Front. Little known even today in the West, this shaped the fate of Europe as much as Operation Overlord. On the 21st of June, the Red Army unleashed its summer offensive into Bielorussia. The impact was devastating. In five weeks, while Eisenhower and Montgomery were bogged down in Normandy, the Red Army destroyed 20 German divisions and drove forward 450 miles to the gates of Warsaw. But when the Polish Home Army rose up against the Nazis, the Soviets provided little help. Admittedly, the Red Army was now exhausted and in no condition to assault a well-defended city. But Stalin, with reason, viewed the Warsaw Rising as a deliberate attempt by the Poles to liberate their country before it fell under Soviet control. Churchill, angered by the Soviet attitude, pressed Stalin to offer aid. Machiavellian as ever in his approach to ends and means, Roosevelt kept out of this argument. For him, the real goal continued to be forging a long-term partnership with the Soviet leader. At Tehran, he'd even pretended to snooze when Stalin and Churchill haggled over the details of Eastern Europe, joking, I don't care two hoots about Poland. Wake me up when we talk about Germany. But the Warsaw Rising did have a significant effect on Roosevelt's ambassador to Russia, Avril Harriman. The Soviet response to the Warsaw Rising left Harriman feeling FDR was too confident about the Soviet regime gradually adopting Western democratic ways. The question became even more pressing when, in September 1944, the Red Army broke through into Romania and Bulgaria. 
the Soviets were clearly going to be a presence in Eastern Europe after the war was over. How should the West deal with them?